Little Women by Louisa May Alcott Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, We haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say, perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. Nobody spoke for a minute. Then Meg said in an altered tone, You know the reason mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone, and she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices, and ought to do it gladly, but I'm afraid I don't. And Meg shook her head as she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. But I don't think the little we should spend would do any good. We've each got a dollar, and the army wouldn't be much helped by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from mother or you, but I do want to buy Undine and Sintram for myself. I've wanted it so long, said Joe, who was a bookworm. I plan to spend mine on new music, said Beth with a little sigh, which no one heard but the hearth brush and kettle holder. I shall get a nice box of Faber's drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy decidedly. Mother didn't say anything about our money, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Joe, examining the heels of her shoes in a gentlemanly manner. I know I do, teaching those tiresome king children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home, began Meg in the complaining tone again. You don't have half such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out of the window or cry? It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross, and my hands get so stiff I can't practice well at all. And Beth looked at her rough hands with a sigh that anyone could hear that time. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy. For you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and label your father if he isn't rich and insult you when your nose isn't nice. If you mean libel, I'd say so and not talk about labels as if Papa was a pickle bottle, advised Joe, laughing. I know what I mean, and you needn't be satirical about it. It's proper to use good words and improve your vocabulary, returned Amy with dignity. Don't peck at one another, children. Don't you wish we had the money Papa lost when we were little, Joe? Dear me, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries, said Meg, who could remember better times. The clock struck six, and Beth put a pair of slippers down to warm. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls, for a mother was coming, and everyone brightened to welcome her. They are quite worn out, said Joe. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with a decided. I'm the man of the family now Papa is away, and I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. That's like you, dear. What will we get? exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute, 
Then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands, I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs, all hemmed, said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it, and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils, added Amy. How will we give the things, asked Meg. Put them on the table and bring her in and see her open the bundles. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There is so much to do. Just then a cheery voice was heard at the door, and they all turned to welcome a tall motherly lady with a can I help you look about her, which was truly delightful. Well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do getting the boxes ready to go tomorrow that I didn't come home to dinner. Has anyone called, Beth? How is your cold, Meg? Joe, you look tired to death. Come and kiss me, baby. While making these maternal inquiries, Mrs. March got her wet things off, her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. As they gathered about her, Mrs. March said with a particularly happy face, I've got a treat for you. A quick, bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. Beth clapped her hands, and Joe cried, A letter! A letter! Three cheers for father! Yes, a nice, long letter. He is well, and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas. And an especial message to you girls, said Mrs. March, patting her pocket as if she had got a treasure there. When will he come home, Army? asked Beth with a little quiver in her voice. Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now, come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire, mother in the big chair with Beth at her feet, Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair, and Joe leaning on the back, where no one would see any sign of emotion if the letter should happen to be touching. Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those which fathers sent home. In this one little was said of the hardships endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter, full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches, and military news. And only at the end did the writer's heart overflow with fatherly love and longing for the little girls at home. Give them all my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I see them. But remind them that while we wait, we may all work, so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Everybody sniffed when they came to that part. Jo wasn't ashamed of the great tear that dropped off the end of her nose, and Amy never minded the rumpling of her curls as she hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out, I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he mayn't be disappointed in me by and by. We all will, cried Meg. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but won't any more if I can help it. I'll try and be what he loves to call me, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else, said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. Beth said nothing, but wiped away her tears with the blue army sock and began to knit with all her might, losing no time in doing the duty that lay nearest her, while she resolved in her quiet little soul to be all that father hoped to find her when the year brought round the happy coming home. Mrs. March broke the silence that followed Joe's words by saying in her cheery voice, Do you remember how you used to play Pilgrim's Progress when you were little things? Nothing delighted you more than to have me tie my peace bags on your backs for burdens, give you hats and sticks and rolls of paper, 
and let you travel through the house from the cellar, which was the city of destruction, up, up to the housetop, where you had all the lovely things you could collect to make a celestial city. Well, it is a play we are playing all the time in one way or another. Our burdens are here, our road is before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide that leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace which is a true celestial city. Now, my little pilgrims, suppose you begin again, not in play, but in earnest, and see how far on you can get before Father comes home. Really, Mother? Where are our bundles? asked Amy, who was a very literal young lady. Each of you told what your burden was just now, except Beth. I rather think she hasn't got any, said her mother. Yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters and envying girls with nice pianos and being afraid of people. Beth's bundle was such a funny one that everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did, for it would have hurt her feelings very much. Let us do it, said Meg thoughtfully. It is only another name for trying to be good, and the story may help us. For though we do want to be good, it's hard work, and we forget and don't do our best. We were in the slough of despond tonight, and Mother came and pulled us out as help did in the book. We ought to have our role of directions, like Christian. What should we do about that? asked Joe, delighted with the fancy which lent a little romance to the very dull task of doing her duty. Look under your pillows Christmas morning, and you will find your guidebook, replied Mrs. March. Joe was the first to wake in the gray dawn of Christmas morning. No stockings hung at the fireplace, and for a moment she felt as much disappointed as she did long ago when her little sock fell down because it was so crammed with goodies. Then she remembered her mother's promise, and slipping her hand under her pillow, drew out a little crimson-covered book. She knew it very well, for it was that beautiful old story of the best life ever lived and Joe felt that it was a true guidebook for any pilgrim going the long journey. She woke Meg with a Merry Christmas and bade her see what was under her pillow. A green-covered book appeared with the same picture inside and a few words written by their mother, which made their one present very precious in their eyes. Presently, Beth and Amy woke to rummage and find their little books also, one dove-colored, the other blue, and all sat looking at and talking about them, while the east grew rosy with the coming day.